I'm Dom Nichols, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we hear how China has rebuked Russia for the killing of 52 civilians last week, and we go live to the Labour Party conference in Liverpool. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. We need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield to win the war. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday, we sit down with leading journalists from The Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Tuesday, the 10th of October, one year and 228 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today, I'm joined by foreign correspondent Colin Freeman, live in Ukraine, and David Knowles at the Labour Party conference in Liverpool. Plus, we have a couple of interviews later on. I started with the latest updates from Ukraine. First of all, Ukraine's Air Force says it destroyed 27 of 36 Russian attack drones overnight across the south of the country. The Shahid 131 and 136 drones were targeting southern Hezon, Mykolaiv and Odessa regions. This is as per the Air Force from Telegram. In all, Moscow launched 36 of the Iranian Russian made drones. The Air Force did not say where the other nine. Uh, ended up. Now next, at the UN Security Council yesterday in New York, China rebuked Russia over last week's missile attack at the funeral uh, in Ukraine that killed 52 people. So Geng Zhuang, who's China's deputy UN ambassador, said Beijing finds the heavy civilian casualties in the attack on the village of Hrosa as concerning. That was the word he used, concerning, which doesn't sound Massively strong, but in Chinese diplomacy, that is significant. They very, very rarely say anything publicly against Moscow's message. We've seen it before briefly when Putin's been rattling the nuclear sabre. But very very rare do we see an an intervention like this, and certainly in a, a forum such as the UN Security Council. So I think it is worth noting. Now, you'll remember at least 52 people were killed in Thursday's strike last week. A Russian Iskander ballistic missile hit the memorial service. That was one of the biggest losses of life since the start of the full-scale invasion. Just so you're aware, it matters not, but Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov last Friday denied Russia was responsible for the Grozer attack. And uh, yesterday, Vasily Nabenzia, Russia's UN ambassador, oh, here we go, Nazi, Nazi, Nazis. He alleged neo-Nazis and military-aged men were at the wake. I mean, all right, there's a difference between a military-aged man and being a man in the military. But anyway, he said neo-Nazis and military-aged men were at the wake He told the UN Security Council that the soldier being buried was a high-ranking Ukrainian nationalist, which I think is utter nonsense. Oh, here we go again, with a lot of neo-Nazis accomplices attending. So, if in doubt, just hit the Nazi button. Nazi, 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 they're all Nazis. Next, Ukrainian authorities are investigating 260 criminal cases involving alleged violations at military recruitment offices. This comes out of the State Bureau of Investigations, the SBI. You may remember President Zelensky dismissed the heads of a number of regional recruitment centres in August uh, after widespread allegations of criminal abuse and corruption. Now, the SBI, as I said, the State Bureau of Investigations, they've said that 21 indictments against 35 individuals had been sent to court and that another 58 people have been identified as suspects. They say it had documented around $110,000 worth of alleged bribes and that courts had seized around $88,000 worth of property. In a statement, the SBI said, although the vast majority of employees conscientiously perform their duties, in many regions there are cases of abusing official positions or exceeding authority. Now then, moving on, recent satellite photos have shown a sharp increase in rail traffic along the North Korea to Russia border. This comes from the US think tank, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. They run the uh, Beyond Parallel project and they've observed satellite imagery showing rail traffic between North Korea and Russia in their words dramatically increased. This was since Putin met um, Kim Jong-un in September. Now, the Centre for Strategic and International Studies, they say there is a marked difference in the external characteristics of containers and equipment compared to those seen in recent years and assess that it's probable that these shipments are or include munitions and artillery. 
And then finally, I just want to note Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich appeared in court again today in Moscow and has his appeal against espionage charges denied yet again. He's now been held unjustly since March. He was arrested while on a reporting trip to the city of Yekaterinburg, about 2,000 kilometres east of Moscow. A judge ruled in August that he must stay in jail until the end of November. Never really been clear why all these delays keep happening. But the court proceedings are closed anyway. Prosecutors say details of the criminal case are classified. So using Evan as a pawn in the games. But he was in court, usual sort of stoic self. He didn't say much and he's often talking in the sort of glass cage that he's held in. But he didn't say an awful lot and is, is sort of not, not resigned to it, but knows the geopolitical game that he is unfortunately a part of. But yeah, we will continue to monitor and report on Evan's progress. Now, it's a great delight to welcome back Colin. I haven't heard from Colin for a few days, somewhere in Ukraine. Colin, where are you and what have you been up to since we last spoke? Hello, I'm out east. I won't say exactly where we are, but not a million miles from Bakhmut, though not, I should stress, right in Bakhmut. Great. Now, Bakhmut has been, or that area has been reported on quite recently, a lot of pushing and pulling there. Ukraine seems to be having more success towards the south and the high ground, I think, to the south Round of Divka and Klishchivka, that kind of area. Are you able to comment on any of that? Yes, we spoke to some troops actually who were involved in the operation to take Klishchivka, which is, is not a big place. It's probably not more than about 500 people. And you'll hopefully be able to read a bit more about that in a piece that I'm hoping to write for the paper uh, sometime in coming days. A village not more than of about 500 folk, and yet it took something like between two and three months to retake it, which I think gives you a, a sense of the of the of the the slow pace sometimes of the counteroffensive. That even a tiny hamlet like that can take ages and ages and ages to recover. You know, we often think of Bakhmut as being a, a battle for a small and relatively insignificant place. This village Kuskushpu is far smaller than that. But that is the reality of, of, of the fighting here, that every scrap of territory is fought over very, very hard. The Russians were apparently putting up a, a very strong fight. So while it may have been a small amount of territory to take, the, the Ukrainians were, were very pleased to get their hands on it. And indeed, the unit I spoke to, they said that on the night that the, the flag finally went up in Klishkivka, President Zelensky and gave them a mention in dispatches in his nightly video address. That was back in mid-September. Yeah, now can you talk to us a little bit about the ground there? We had Roland on the other day talking about how in some areas, due to plantations that have been going back sort of 60, 70 years, the forestry blocks and the way they're spaced out lend themselves to a lattice work of kind of anti-tank grid. And it's so dug in anti-tank teams have good ranges of fire, kind of 2Ks-ish ranges of fire, makes it incredibly difficult to get through in any kind of armoured vehicles. But I think the ground is slightly different where you are. Are you able to talk to us at all about that? And with a nod towards winter, how much longer do you think there is at the current level, this sort of tempo of fighting? Well, certainly the Ukrainians have been fighting around here for so long now that one commander told me that they are experts on different soil types. For example, the soil up around here in Bakhmut is different to the soil down in Zaporizhzhia or around Kherson. And they know exactly what characteristics it will have when rain comes and whether it will liquefy very quickly, how sticky it will be, how much it will mess up their vehicles, I suspect. But in terms of that overall effect, certainly the seasons are changing here. Today, we or yesterday, I think it was, we saw the first frosts around here. That there is, You get different answers as to what exact effect the changing of the seasons will have. The standard reasoning, as you, you may have read a lot of, is that once the rains come, which precede the winter freeze, there is a long period of several weeks of very, very wet, and muddy weather where, you know, every, all the fields over which all these kind of most of the military forces here have, have built rat runs dug into these earth fields. All that will turn into just a quagmire and effectively the fighting will stop. But again, it depends what aspect of the armed forces you're asking. For example, the tank commanders say, look, we can carry on. We can drive over muddy ground if we want. Some of the infantry guys say, no, it does really slow us up. And others are pointing out, look, this time last year we carried on fighting nonetheless. 
But I, I think overall there will be a bit of a reduction in the in in the tempo. Certainly, that seems to be the consensus. Even if the fighting does still go on, one thing that did stick in my mind that we were talking to Daniel Ridley. I was meeting him, who uh, some listeners may remember has been on the podcast a few times before. He's a, a former British soldier. He's been out here for a few years. He actually served as a full-time soldier with the Ukrainian army for several years and is now running the Trident Defense Initiative, which is a training um, program up near Kharkiv. He said that in his time in the trenches in Ukraine, b- before the war in the Donbass and, and around, w- when winter came, the real problem was just so it was just so bloody cold nobody really felt inclined to do very much. The instinct overall, I think, was to to hunker down and protect your own territory. But when you're dealing with temperatures of maybe minus 20 degrees centigrade, the appetite for going up and charging the enemy certainly diminishes. He also pointed out that when it's that cold, everything is like a bloody ice rink. So it's not the time when you want to be storming a trench or anything like that. Well, it's certainly not. It's also not the time for bad kits because that kind of temperature, you know, the human hand will freeze to the metal of a gun barrel, for example. So if you've not got gloves, not got decent kit, you're in all sorts of clip. Just finally, before you go, Colin, obviously the events in Israel and Gaza still unfolding as we speak. We're not going to do it to the depth that we did yesterday. I'm not especially taken with this idea that it was all that was all some massive Russian plot. I do think Russia benefits by having international attention split in two two places but i don't think there's i don't think there's a huge amount more than that directly stepping back the the sort of mouse droppings back to moscow if i'm not mixing too many metaphors but what's the chatter where you are about what's been happening in israel and, and any impact after president zelensky's comments yesterday about how that might be a, a, impacting the war well here I, where i am out east I, I wouldn't say it's a huge talking point obviously people have their own existential war that they're having to deal with here so it's not uppermost on people's minds. I think what the average person in the street, if they know much about it at all, would note is that Hamas is backed by Iran, and Iran is the same country that is providing Russia with drones that are attacking Ukraine. So I think many Ukrainians would be saying, look, you know, this is all part of the same axis of powers that are making our lives a misery here in Ukraine are also involved indirectly or otherwise in the horrors in Israel. Israel and Ukraine have quite a complex relationship, which now is perhaps not the best time to go into that, um, that Israel has stood by Ukraine's during the Russian invasion and condemned it, but it stopped short of providing Ukraine with its Iron Dome defense system, which has caused a bit of frustration here in Kiev, especially given that President Zelensky is, of course, Jewish. It stopped short of doing that, though, because of, of, broadly speaking, because of fears of antagonizing Russia too much. And that all ties into the issue of Russia's presence in Syria, where Russia in turn turns a blind eye to Israel carrying out attacks on Hezbollah and Iranian Revolutionary Guard presences in Syria. So it it all gets rather complicated. And I, I dare say the relationship may be strengthened a little by what's happened. But at the moment, from what I've gathered from people connected to the d- defense establishment here in Ukraine, nobody really expects Israel to, to do anything on the international stage until this immediate domestic crisis is resolved. And that, that, that could be months, months, if not years away. Sure. Well, Colin, thank you so much for that. Please stay safe. We'll speak to you again in another few days and hear about what you've been up to wherever you are in the East. But Colin, thanks so much. And we will speak to you again soon you're welcome bye now then over to the north of england we've got david knowles who is at the labor party conference here so the opposition party here in the united kingdom at the moment all the polls say they're on course for victory to be the next government and keir starmer the leader to be the next prime minister a long way to go before that election but important to hear what the politicos are saying so david what have you been up to who have you been chatting to and, uh, and what messages has come out of the conference today? 
Well, yes, as you said, I'm up here in Liverpool. I'm actually in the same building the UK hosted Eurovision for Ukraine earlier this year. We're looking out over the Mersey. On the other side of the river, we can see uh, several British warships. I think they're being refitted. And, uh, yeah, just a couple of months ago, our own Francis Derny was here, tripping the light fantastic, reporting on uh, UK-Ukraine U- Eurovision. I'm here at the Lab- Labour Party conference. Listeners will remember I was at Conservative Party conference last week. That was to try and understand the current ruling party in the UK, the Conservative Party's views on Ukraine and how that might have changed. We heard a lot from Grant Shapps, the Defence Secretary, and we also spoke to some Ukrainian MPs who were visiting party conference. Just for listeners to get a bit more context, the UK will have a general election next year. We don't know when it's being called. There's all sorts of rumours going around the political bazaars. Maybe as early as May. Remember the last political election in 2019 was in the winter. It seems as if people don't want to repeat that. So we're here just to try and scope out and understand the Labour Party's views on Ukraine. It's been very interesting, of course, and for for several reasons. I haven't quite been able to get to as many fringe events as we did before I spoke to you when we called in to the Conservative Party, but I have seen the Shadow Defence Secretary John Healy speak, and we've been able to chat to a couple of other Labour Party members. First of all, just on John Healy, one thing that really struck me in the event that I saw him speak at was whereas in the Conservative conference, Ukraine was, above everything else, the most talked about, the most thought about issue. This week feels very different. It feels like there's a lot going on. And it was very interesting to hear Healy's points. He spoke about the Arctic and about British interests in the Arctic. He spoke about Israel, of course, given the events over the weekend, spoke about Iran. It feels as if whoever the the next Defence Secretary and Foreign Secretary coming in to the office after the next general election in the UK, the scope of what they all have to deal with, certainly in the Labour Party, it it feels as if they're talking about it in a much wider sense of what what they think they will need to, to be dealing with. We also heard from Alexandra Kornienko, first deputy of the RADA, former head of the Servant of the People, that's Sluhada Nodu uh, Zelensky's party, in a fringe this morning. He was very interesting. I mean, it was a very interesting panel, a completely packed room. He spoke about his own children's experience of the Russian invasion. He spoke about them just a month ago. He spoke about how Shahid drones being fired at Kiev and his children continuing to sleep because it's a thing that happens so regularly that they weren't particularly perturbed by it, which I thought was, um, you, know, you, you could hear the people in the room, there was this, some silence when he said that. He also spoke about the impact of British diplomacy and how, to some extent, how it's used by Ukraine. So something I've heard a lot of over the past two days is the idea that Again, whoever wins the next general election, and it's not a foregone conclusion, it will be the Labour Party. John Healy talked about how every meeting that Keir Starmer, the leader of the opposition, starts, he starts with this phrase, no complacency. They're not taking anything for granted that they want to win, and they don't think that they're just going to waltz into victory. But something that Healy spoke about, and I think Lamy's shadow foreign secretary has spoken about, is the idea that Britain needs to continue being proactive uh, and, and leading on support for Ukraine. Um, and now what does that actually mean practically? There's, a, you know, there's, there's obviously one answer, which is it means further weapon support, sending more things to Ukraine, although, as, as we know from the past few weeks, there are questions, of course, of what more Britain can give and should give. Um, but one of the things Kornienko was talking about was how he said one of the one of the incredibly helpful things that British early support for anything does diplomatically is it enables the Ukrainians to go to other allies and political parties around Europe and say, well, the Brits have done this, they've given us X, they've given us Y, come on, well, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing? So it sets a bar for how they then interact with other countries, which I thought was quite interesting. And, and he sort of explained it in two ways. He said, one in terms of weapons delivery, the other was political support. So one of the things we've been talking about a little bit, and I'll explain later maybe, Dom, if you'd like, is just trying to understand how the Labour Party and the British left, its level of support for Ukraine and how that's changed over the years. You'll remember that the previous leader of the Labour Party was Jeremy Corbyn, who lost to Boris Johnson in 2019, who had been accused of being soft on Russia and Russian policy. So it's still a live question, I think, within parts of the British left about support for Ukraine. And that's something we've been... You'll hear that in some of the interviews I've been doing later, so I won't go into it too much now. But Kornienko was quite interesting because he said the bipartisan nature of the British support so far for Ukraine, that's to say it is not an issue of contention between the Labour Party and opposition and the Conservative Party and government. The fact that, you know, as you know, we spent a lot of Conservative conference asking Conservative MPs, uh, you know, were they worried about Labour potentially being in power when it came to Ukraine? And we just got a blanket no. They, they told us they're great to work with and we have confidence it shouldn't be a bipartisan issue. 
And Konienko talked about how that's useful when they go around Europe and speak to other political parties, not necessarily nations, but other political parties in Europe, saying, look how united the Brits are on this, that the left, the right, they all agree this is the right thing to do. And that, again, sets an example. So those were two things I think Alexander Konienko said that I think I, I, I hadn't heard put in such blunt terms before. So that gives you a sense of what's going on. As I said, right now, the lounge I'm speaking from is emptying because the leader's speech, Keir Starmer's speech to the party, probably the last leader's speech we'll hear before the next general election in the United Kingdom, is that we hear the hall is filling up. Obviously, we've not been able to get a ticket for that. But that will be the moment where we'll really hear how Keir Starmer thinks about Ukraine and foreign policy. After that, I'll be going to the Labour Friends of Ukraine reception, set up by Labour Party members. It's very similar, of course, to the Conservative Friends of Ukraine I, I went to last week. And there are, w- will be, of course, some Ukrainian MPs present. So that, that'll be really, really interesting. But yes, Don, that kind of gives you a sense of what we're seeing. I, I mean, I would say there's definitely a buzz about this conference that I, I you know, it's only my first time going to both, so it's difficult to say. But it feels like there's a buzz here that the Conservative Party conference potentially lacked. I was helping out with the Telegraph video team, uh, doing a completely different thing, just asking people, did they think Keir Starmer looked like a Prime Minister? And every single answer we got was totally on message, 100%, not the kind of potentially divided thoughts we thought we might find from some of the Labour Party faithful. But that kind of sums up what I've been seeing, Dom. I can tell you a little bit about the, um, the interviews I've been doing, if that's helpful, but is there anything you'd like to know from me? I mean, that all sounds fine, but actually... I listened to David Lammy, Shadow Foreign Secretary, and John Healy, Shadow Defence Secretary's speeches, and they didn't really say anything. It was all very correct and bland, and we stand with Ukraine, and we support this, and we don't like baddies, and, and what have you. Yeah, and it all gets, yeah, you know, tub-thumping and lots of clapping, but they didn't actually say anything. And it does speak to this idea that Labour's policy at the moment, as you said, they are not complacent at all that they're going to win the election next year. But their policy at the moment seems to be to make themselves as small as possible. So there is no target for the Conservatives to aim at. So they're just not saying anything. Now, you could argue that a period of boring politics is absolutely the tonic we could all do with right now. But I've yet to detect any real standout policy or statement from anybody there. Same, same, the Conservative conference last week. The the biggest thing seemed to be the Prime Minister going on about how he was going to very slowly ban smoking, which was largely dying out of the country anyway. But I mean, if that's the big conference thing, then we're all in all in trouble. But, you know, you've got the Conservatives trying to position themselves as the party of change, having been in power for 13 years. And you've got the Labour Party that seems to be trying to make as small a target as possible so they can't be hit with anything, but by doing so, not saying anything. And it all just seems a bit flat. I mean, have I read that wrong? Have you have you seen any particular standout, either policy or comment, opinion, um, from any anything from a leading shadow cabinet member? I think Healy talks about NATO first. He wants the potential next Labour, Labour government to lean into... NATO and be a leader in NATO. I think that hearing that sort of British leadership point echoed across different fringes, echoed across different ministers, and also from the Ukrainian allies, I thought that was quite interesting. I think what you're saying though is, okay, that's all very well and good. What does that actually mean? And I think, to be honest, we'll hear a bit from Keir Starmer later. Whether we'll hear detail on that, I don't know. I I sort of side with you, I think, Dom, that we we don't... (laughs) We're not entirely sure how much detail he, he will give. As you said, that seems to be just making sure that they can't be attacked on anything just yet. But I think what you'll hear in some of the interviews I've done, as I alluded to earlier, the left, the British left, and maybe across Europe as well, we've seen it, does have an issue when it comes to Russia. Certainly it's had a big issue historically. And I spoke to Paul Mason, journalist and Labour member, former economics editor at Channel 4 News, about this. And he gave quite an interesting history and his take. And he's very, very left-wing and very, very pro-Ukraine. So it was very interesting talking to him about some of his ideas of why this has happened, how this is changing. And, and he did make the point that, you know, it's not a thing which is over. It's an ongoing battle within the left, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah, I, th- I mean, I think you're basically right. I think the aim of this conference, and uh, apologies to listeners, this is getting a bit inside baseball, a bit inside British politics, but we think this is useful just to try and give a sense of how the war in Ukraine and policy to Ukraine is playing out on a, on a sort of local national level. This conference is about presenting the Labour Party as a professional outfit, a committed outfit, an outfit that people can trust, and that means going into the next election as the favourites. So it's been
been quite interesting. It's, yeah, there's definitely a buzz. I, I've been interested in that Ukraine hasn't dominated as an issue in the same way that it felt like it did at the Conservative Party conference. And there's all sorts of potential reasons for that, I think. But that's certainly something I've noticed. But we'll, I, I'll have to come back to you later, I think, after, the, after Keir Starmer's speech and after some of the contacts we'll make at the Ukraine Labour reception to get a bit more of a sense of how parliamentarians are feeling about this. So we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. I'll be keen to hear which of the two party conferences has just been more fun, either more chitter chatter or more um, or craziness at the bar. Right, David, final thoughts. Well, very quickly, something that I've put to both Conservatives and Labour members and parliamentarians last week and this week has been the bipartisan nature of British support for Ukraine and asking them both, you know, do they have any worries or about the other side, if you like, and what it's been like working with them on support for Ukraine. And I think it must be said that this is true bipartisan politics. I haven't detected really a a, a scintilla of... um, of doubt or worry from either party about their opposite numbers about around support for Ukraine, which in some ways is um, extremely warming warming to hear. We recognise how uh, divided often politics is in the UK and in many, many countries. Um, but it does seem as if the bipartisan nature of British support for Ukraine is holding across the British Labour and Conservative parties. It seems as if if there is a transition of power, so far the signs are is that would be relatively smooth and felt like they've tried to make it clear to me that no matter what happens in the next British general election, their Ukrainian friends and allies shouldn't have anything to worry about or, or fear. And I think that's played out differently in both parties, but it's really come across from the people we talked to at the Conservative Party conference, Alicia Kearns, Jack Lepresti, and here speaking to members of the Labour for Ukraine movement and hearing Lamy and Healy as well. So I think that that's a definite positive we can take. As to which conference has been more fun, I, it's hard to say. I don't know. It, it, I certainly were a lot more tired on this one. As, as you know, Don, we've been on the road for many, many weeks now. I was in Ukraine in June. Uh, we've been in Washington. We're in uh, Manchester. We're in Liverpool. We're very, very exhausted. I think they've both got advantages and disadvantages, and I, I probably have to have to leave it there. Yesterday at the Labour Party conference, I spoke to Alexei Goncharenko, People's Deputy of Ukraine for the European Solidarity Party. Goncharenko is an opposition MP. The party he's a member of is led by Petro Poroshenko, Ukraine's former president, defeated by Zelensky in 2019. We spoke about Ukrainian politics, his views of British support to Ukraine, and I think you'll find it interesting. He was fairly blunt with his criticisms of the current Ukrainian administration. Here's our conversation. Well, thank you so much for your time. Could you just introduce yourself to our listeners? My name is Oleksiy Goncherenko, member of the Parliament of Ukraine and member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Can you tell us why you've come to Labour Conference? We in Ukraine very closely are following the political situation in the United Kingdom because it's one of our key allies and it's clear that Labour Party has high chances to win next elections in one year and taking into account that next autumn will be critical and very important because also there will be elections in the United States. And we see that there is a chance that forces who want the United States to leave the world stage, or at least partly leave it, can take a lead. And in this case, that will be a crucial role for the United Kingdom to lead. As in February 2022, when the United Kingdom did it, And uh, I just want to spread a message that a possible Labour government should be prepared not just to support Ukraine because we have bipartisan support in the UK and we appreciate it and we are very thankful for this, but also to lead the efforts of the free world. And that is a much more difficult task. That's why I am here to spread this message, to inform, also to keep Ukraine in the focus of uh, Labour conference and uh, of political elites in the United Kingdom. I was at Conservative Party conference last week and it was clear there really that Ukraine was almost the dominant issue. But in the fringe we've just been in, lots of different things were talked about. Iran, obviously Israel, after the news over the weekend. Uh, How worried are you that Ukraine will fall off the, the front pages? I think it will not happen and I see a lot of support. But it's a, it's work. It's already something we should do and we should work on uh, in order to remind about Ukraine, about the importance of Ukraine. And even the situation in, in the Middle East, it shows that when we were saying that blocking of the Black Sea, which directly hurt 
World Food Security and which led to change of uh, and increasing of food prices in the world. It's also one of the reasons what uh, had happened in Gaza in city and of these awful terrorist attacks and even terrorist war against Israel from Hamas. So there is a risk of losing attention to Ukraine and we need to tackle this challenge and we need to work in order to keep the focus on Ukraine because this is crucial. And as John Healy, Shadow Defense Secretary, said that protection of the United Kingdom today starts on Ukrainian soil because Ukraine is fighting not just for itself. What do you make so far of uh, Labour's support for Ukraine? Do you feel reassured coming here and seeing it for yourself? Uh, yeah, I see this support. I feel this support. I see that Ukrainian topic is high on the agenda, and that's good. We need to continue to work with uh, both Conservatives and Labour in, uh, in the United Kingdom, also in order to inform them what's going on, to explain what is important. So um, I can tell you that I am satisfied with what I see. And also, like, I hope to push it even forward and further. Like Shadow Secretary Lamy said that today, that uh, Ukraine has a rightful path to NATO, has all the right to move to NATO. But I already asked uh, Shadow Secretary Healy, and I will to continue, that maybe need, you need to change wording, not just from a rightful path, but Ukraine should become a member of NATO as soon as possible. So the wording matters. So we need... Again, the United Kingdom showed leadership and I think should continue to show leadership on Ukraine. And that is very important for us. If you were able to speak to Keir Starmer, you know, potentially the next Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, what would you, what would you say to him in, in a sentence? First, that I, what I told you, that he should be prepared to lead the free world in support of Ukraine in, uh, immediately after, if he will become, immediately if and after he will become uh, Prime Minister. Secondly, that one of the key areas should be uh, in his uh, agenda should be Black Sea, because the situation is Black Sea is very important, and the United Kingdom can do more there, because the United Kingdom is at the same time one of the uh, most powerful navies in the world, and at the same time uh, maritime insurance hub of the world, and from both positions, the United Kingdom can help to deblock the uh, Black Sea, to open the, uh, the ways to export Ukrainian crops to the world. And according to estimations of United Nations, 400 million people in the world are dependent from the calories from Ukrainian crop, uh, crops. So that should be his topic and very important. And thirdly, it should be NATO accession of Ukraine. Uh, and I would like to remind him and us that uh, one of the founders of NATO who birthed NATO, uh, like it was said today by Mr. Lemmy, was Labour Foreign Secretary Bivin in the government of Mr. Attlee. And that was a very important moment uh, in history. And that gave to you, this region 70 years of security. But in order to have next decades secure in the region, uh, we need to expand NATO and to take Ukraine in NATO. So I think these three topics, to be ready to lead, to be focused on the Black Sea and to help Ukraine to become a member of NATO. That can be his heritage if uh, uh, he will become Prime Minister. Can I ask, just quickly, here at Labour Conference, this is a political party getting together, potentially on the brink of power. Is this what you do in Ukraine? What's a political uh, party conference like in Ukraine? Is, does this, does this, do you look around and think, oh, I get this, this makes sense? Uh, no, I like it very much, first of all. Secondly, we, before invasion, we tried to do the same, but never on such big scale. Uh, the problem of Ukrainian parties is that Ukrainian parties are very connected to the leader. More usually, because we are young democracy, usually the leaders are creating the parties, and when the leaders lose their, I don't know, the, it's with time or with something happening, uh, when the leaders are leaving the stage, the parties are leaving the stage with them and the new parties are creating with the new leaders. So in Ukraine, we will have the first real party at the moment when the leader will leave, but the party will continue to be like, I mean, on the high level on the, with the real chances. So that definitely it's inspiring to see it and very interesting. I had an honor to be 
John Smith fellow to the, in 2006. Uh, John Smith was the f leader of Labour Party in 1990s before Tony Blair. And uh, after his sudden death, his family organized the John Smith Fellowship program. And uh, I had an honor to be selected one of the fellows in 2006. So I, I, I saw how the political system works in the United Kingdom and it's a very vivid, rich democracy and uh, we have a lot of to, to, to make lessons from and in, from the political point of view. And for Ukraine, democracy and keeping democracy is extremely important. We have challenges in this. Unfortunately, we have autocratic tendencies in our country. We need to secure democracy and uh, United Kingdom expertise can be very valuable for us. Just on that, am I right in understanding you weren't able to go to the Conservative Party conference last week? Is that what happened there? Yes, that's true, uh, because now we have a quite strange, not quite, very strange system when uh, the member of the parliament to leave the country, to cross the border, needs to receive a special permission of the Speaker of the Parliament. And the situation is that representatives of ruling party, they don't have problems with receiving such permissions, and representatives of opposition have such problems and for example me personally unfortunately it's not the first time and not even the second time where when I can't take part in some international events including my duties in the Parliament Assembly of the Council of Europe because I am not because I haven't received this permission and it's just one of examples of kind of a pressure on opposition we have a governmental control over media we have pressure on local government Partly it is understandable because of martial law time, but just partly. Unfortunately, uh, sometimes we see how the war is used to justify just quite autocratic steps. And that's something which we should prevent to continue, because that is the strength of Ukraine. In general, this Russian war against Ukraine shows the strength of democracy, because this is the war of Russian vertical against Ukrainian horizontal. That's not a one-man war. I mean, President Zelensky, no, it's the, the war of the whole society. And because it's the war of the whole society, we are so successful. But uh, we need to continue like this. A and that is important. In general, you asked me about the lessons. One of the lessons that the United Kingdom shows to us, when in 1940, when Churchill became prime minister, what first he did, he invited Attlee and uh, Labour to the government, and they formed... I, th I don't remember, I think 600 MPs from 610, something like this, were in coalition. And like we saw the same in Israel, where Netanyahu invited opposition, and the level of mutual hate between them is very high. But in the face of uh, existential threat, they united. Unfortunately, it's not the case in Ukraine, where the opposition was not invited to take part in government and still is sidelined fr fr from the decision-making but we try our best on all places and at all places and at all areas we can. Just finally, the things, the, some of the issues you, you think you see in, within Ukrainian democracy, do you think they're getting worse now after nearly uh, 20 months of war? Or do, do you see any, um, are there any reasons to hope as well? No, the hope is absolutely here because Ukrainian people defended uh, democracy many times. Uh, Ukrainian people defended it in 2004, def Ukrainian people defended it in 2013-14. Uh, then Ukrainian people are defending our democracy with the weapons in their hands now. So I am absolutely sure that Ukrainian people will not uh, give possibility to anybody to take their freedom. So I am absolutely sure about this. Uh, but speaking uh, what dynamics we have, the dynamics is not good. I mean, we see that that is when the guy it's in the human nature. Uh, nobody wants to be asked. And when the government cannot be asked for one month, six months, 12 months, 11 months, oh, sorry, 18 months, 19 months, they just got used to this. They got used, uh, and that is a bad story. They should not be in a warm bath. They, there should be debate, there should be discussion around how to win, not about anything else. All of us were united in our desire to win over Russia. But how to reach this? What should be a strategy? What should be priorities? That is something which should be debated. That's the strength of democracy. Because that makes you you're taking all possible points of view, all expertise, and by this you're making the best decisions. Because everybody can make mistakes.
Is there anything we haven't spoken about that you think is important for our listeners to hear? I just want to say a great thank you to people of the United Kingdom for all support. I can tell you, I see many countries and I know situation there. And uh, really in many countries we see some kind of wavering of support. And I don't see it, fortunately, in the United Kingdom. And that's why it's so important for us that UK uh, will continue like this and can really lead. It's not just words. We really count on UK leadership. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Alexei. Earlier today, I also spoke to Paul Mason. Paul Mason has written frequently about his support for Ukraine from a left-wing British perspective. I wanted to understand more about the left, Russia and Ukraine. Certainly in Britain, there's a lot of accusations that some members of the left-wing parties have been soft on Russia. Paul seemed like an ideal person to talk to, to try and get a bit more of understanding about where this comes from what the situation is in the party at the moment and what it might look for in the future, especially under a potential Labour government. I'm Paul Mason. I'm a journalist. I work for the New European. I write opinion pieces for some new European newspapers. I am a prolific book writer working on the history of communism. And um, I, in the context of this interview, I've been active in the British Labour movement in support of Ukraine since before the invasion. And a, a lot of my writing is, is an attempt to do thought leadership about what the left should do about the, you know, the challenge of the systemic competition we find ourselves in with Russia. One of the accusations towards the left broadly has been that it's, uh, especially in the UK, soft on Russia historically. Could you give us your sense of why this is and maybe a bit of the history of, of the left and Russia? There's one obvious reason why the left would be soft on Russia, and that is the, the existence of the Soviet Union from 1917 to, to 1991. I come from a part of the left that is anti-Stalinist, and I, I am 63, and I've spent my years since I, my mid-teens fighting against the influence of orthodox communism and we have to remember that although the Soviet Union itself died and the the old nostalgic sort of reenactment groups the old communist parties uh, have died out you know they're li mainly living on the legacies of people who have deceased unfortunately a new kind of left has grown up that is by definition anti-humanist and its sources are not the Soviet Union its sources are academic anti-humanist philosophy and they found it very easy, easy to pick up the themes of post-Soviet Russian imperialism and indeed Chinese quote-unquote anti-imperialism which says there is no universal rights, there is no universal principles, the charter system 1945 is dead, uh, we're in a multipolar world where your version of democracy in the West is imperialist and my version where the Communist Party of China is the only party and a bunch of advisory parties are allowed to exist. That's equally democratic. The, the problem, in other words, that people like me are facing is not just an old problem, it's a revived problem. Stalinism is not a zombie ideology, it's a living ideology. Just for our listeners, especially in the US, could you give us your views on the Labour Party? We're here at Labour Conference, yeah. there's, there's Keir Starmer could be the next Prime Minister, yeah. but of course the previous leader of the Labour Party was Jeremy Corbyn, who, is, who was criticised for, and, for being and, and I was someone who tried to work with and collaborate with Corbyn. And indeed Keir Starmer was in his shadow cabinet, and so was John Healy, the shadow defence secretary, current shadow defence secretary. So, so Labour's position is quite clear, we are 100% in support of Ukraine and, and it's been clear from the day one indeed before day one of the conflict and the current leadership took action against 11 MPs who mistakenly signed up to a kind of quasi-pacifist declaration saying it's partly NATO's fault they were told you either unsign it or you're out and one of them Jeremy Corbyn is permanently out the others rolled back I think largely because they weren't thinking clearly enough the real the question for, for Labour is not, has it maintained a 100% record of bipartisan support for this government, which it has. And indeed, I know from the context that it has had behind the scenes, the Secretary of State for Defence, Ben Wallace, proactively brought Labour's, his Labour opposite number into, uh, not the decision making, but the information loop. We're going to send in laws. We're going to, this is what we're doing. That's not the question. The question is, how do we maintain the proactivity? 
a uh, new government, hopefully, we, I'm a Labour Party member and activist, new government, hopefully we get into power in the next 12 months. Always finding your feet, you know, 3 a.m., walk into the Ministry of Defence, what do you find? What do you find that you don't know? Does that knock you back from the levels of proactivity? Because Britain has, even compared to the United States at one point, Britain has been, if not the biggest giver, it's been the most proactive mover of the agenda on tanks, on F-16s, on the, the mere idea of the Ramstein format. Uh, we need in Labour to be able to steel ourselves to commit to maintaining Britain's leadership role among the European allies in support of Ukraine. Could you just talk us through your, how you get to your position of support for Ukraine from a left-wing perspective? Yeah. I think that's an interesting comparison, as you said, the sort of the, the, the not zombie Stalinist. Yeah. Unfortunately, there are two lefts. Mm. The, the, the Marxist historian E.P. Thompson said there are two Marxisms. One's a doctrine of unreason, and one is a critical reasoning part of the Enlightenment tradition. And they're actually over Ukraine at war with each other. Uh, your listeners may not know, but I have been. My emails were hacked, apparently by the GRU. I am the subject of a a consistent slam a campaign by Russian uh, proxy mouthpieces, both in the United States and here, simply for taking a high-profile stance in defence of Ukraine. How do I get there? Well, there's three sources of this on the left. I'm a member of Ukraine Solidarity Campaign, which is a left-leaning campaign here in the UK. One is the trade unions. The trade unions have been the strongest supporters, actually, of Ukraine, because many of them, above all the mining union, NUM, which have now, of course, there are no mi- active mines left in Britain. But there are many old miners who've spent their younger days going to Donbass and building solidarity with the Ukrainian miners. Many of, again, many of the Ukrainian mining workforce are Russian speakers. So the idea that this is all about Russian speakers desiring independence and breakaway was known to be rubbish to large numbers of ex-miners. So when I went to Kiev on the eve of the, of the, the current war, one of the people who came with me was the leader of the miners' union. So that's the first thing. The second thing is you've got to remember what, when Vladimir Putin talks about the illegitimacy of Ukraine, he cites Lenin. He says Lenin created this artificial state. The Leninist position, whether you like it or not, was always for the, to, the Ukraine was a state, that it had the right to secede, that was the line in the Soviet constitution. And I'm a no fan of the Soviet constitution or Leninism, but you have to understand that there are large numbers of people who believe in sort of left, radical left politics who have always bought the idea of the right of nations to self-determination, even in the Soviet context. And then the third kind of source for this, I would say, is the fact that there is a thriving left in Ukraine. I'm not talking about the banned political parties who are Russian aligned, specifically German Social Democracy and the German Left Party, which is very dodgy now on the Ukraine, but have they have these things called Stiftungen, foundations, which capacity build in other countries for left-wing politics. And the both the Social Democrats and the left in Germany have built and supported social democratic and left-wing parties and movements in Ukraine. And when I was there, I was there to speak with, to do seminars with, to build solidarity with two groups, one of which is Sozialny Ruch, which means social movement. The other one is SD Platform, which is the social democratic platform. They're tiny in terms of, they have no members of the RADA, but they are, they're tiny in terms of political footprint, but what they've been able to do is to allow left-wing people like me to have a, a point of contact in terms inside Ukraine that isn't the sort of the right of politics. What do you say to uh, your Ukrainian friends and counterparts and so on who maybe voice some um, worry about Labour as the next party of government? What, how, how do you convince them that if, if well, Labour wins the next election? I, I will say this, Labour, that is Labour's task. Labour's task is to convince the, the Zelensky administration and the, the, the authorities in Kiev that it will do uh, not just what it needs to do, ticking the box, because that is true, it's that it will remain proactive and be a leading partner in Europe for deterring Vladimir Putin. Now, how do we convince them? First of all, through what we say. I've, I was with John Healy yesterday, the Shadow Defence Secretary, and he said exactly that. We, our aspiration is to be the leader of, of the leading European NATO country. Now, Labour's not making any commitments to spending right now. That's their choice. I'm a simple rank and file member. I would prefer to them to do that. But it's pretty obvious that they're going to have to spend more to be, be able to, com- to meet that commitment, both in terms of our own land deterrent capability 
in NATO, within NATO, what we're about to offer NATO in its new force structure, and what we're able to do in terms of feeding Ukraine's war machine. I will say, I know, because I have personal contact with them at, at, at this level, that the leadership of the Labour Party are absolutely morally committed to Ukraine. It's the, the, my, my concern, if I was in the Ukrainian side, would be, is British civil society and is the left of British civil society? There, we're not, I think the jury is out. We have a, a, a persuading job to do with the left of British civil society because the, the voices of what you might call the, the pro-BRICS plus, you know, people who think it's great that the world order is falling apart, are not tiny. Jeremy Corbyn may be isolated now, and I think he is, but it's a fact that the politics of, of China has an equal right to set the world agenda, Putin has a point about NATO, are, you'll hear them in pubs. You'll hear them among, among the right, of course, in, in the, and the far right in Britain, but it is, it is there. And ultimately, Labour has always been a pacifist party. Its first four or five leaders were pacifists, and it had to snap out of that in the mid-30s. And I think the leadership had no problem here, understanding that now is the time for rearmament. The Labour movement needs to be equally... It needs to go through the kind of transformation that the Zeitenwende, that the Attlee... The, the Attlee period saw so that it was a big change actually and I think we're in the middle of it I don't think we're at the end of it here in, in the Labour movement That's really fascinating my final question one of the sort of goals of Russian foreign policy is to create this as you kind of just mentioned it, this multipolar world because my understanding is they feel, they feel like they're freer to operate there are fewer constraints do you think with uh, the weekend's tragic news from Israel that we're, we're in that place now already? I think I would describe myself as a, as a Labour Party member as a an idealist in a realist world. That is, I, I, like Attlee, you know, Attlee went in the Second World War saying we must build a world government. Even though we're now signing up that, to the reality that, it, that the League of Nations has fallen apart, we're at world war, the outcome of this war must be a European and a world government, the UN. Attlee and Bevan said this. Bevin said this. That's, what I, that's where I am now in terms of what, what we need to do. And I think that the Hamas terror attack on Israel is for me another symptom. It's what I'm saying to people this week. You want a multipolar world, this is what it looks like. It doesn't look like some kind of peaceful coexistence between China, Russia and America and India. It looks like chaos at the periphery. And it, the, Sorry, Israel, Israel is not the periphery. We see Nagorno, we see Kosovo, we see Sudan, uh, Georgia probably. Russia is scratching at every open sore of the system that's what the multipolar polar world will be. Um, and so the, the solution is not to retreat to a unipolar American power. That's gone. America doesn't want to even want to be a unipolar American power. So we have to rely on reviving the mechanisms of international government. Is there anything that I haven't asked or you'd like to say to our listeners before we finish? I would just say that I know people in Ukraine listen to this and I'll say from here I'm, I'm, I'm standing on the River Mersey on the outs, outs, outside of the Labour Party conference looking across the river at three British warships painted haze grey being rebuilt in the Camel Laird shipyard. Um, our country stands behind Ukraine and I want to move us from a we're with you for however long it takes to a position of whatever it takes. I'm not there yet, but I think the goodwill of the British people is incredibly strong towards people in, in Ukraine. Thank you very much for your time. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so that you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload, so if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it's released, do refer to podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app, and if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. As the disinformation war ramps up, we are relying on your support more than ever. 
You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk and we do read every message. You can also contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was today produced by Rachel Porter and Giles Gear. Executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells. <laughs>